In this video we're going to discuss MPLS or multi-protocol label switching. Here's an example of an MPLS label. MPLS uses 32-bit label headers that are inserted between layer 2 and layer 3, hence the term layer 2 and a half. So we have a layer 2 header which could be Ethernet, but it could also be another layer 2 encapsulation such as PPP. We have the IP version 4 header, and in between those two headers we have the 32-bit MPLS label. The label header consists of a 20-bit label, a 3-bit experimental field, a 1-bit bottom of stack indicator, and a time to live field. Labels are used to switch traffic once again from one interface to another. So P1 could receive traffic destined to CE3 on this interface with a label of 20, and then swap it with a label of 21 and forward it out of this interface. The experimental bit is a 3-bit field which Cisco use for quality of service. This equates to class of service in layer 2 and has some associated values at layer 3. So as an example with layer 3 differentiated services code points or DSCP, we have an equivalent mapping to an experimental value in MPLS. Essentially a service provider could configure a PE router that when it receives traffic from a customer with a CASA 5 or DSCP of EF to mark the traffic going out into the MPLS network with an experimental value of 5. That means that the MPLS network maintains quality of service end-to-end. -end. Over here we could be using COS or DSCP, and then on these links in the MPLS cloud, the routers are prioritizing traffic based on the experimental value in the MPLS label. And then over here, once again, we could be using layer 2 COS or DSCP for quality of service. The bottom of stack indicator is used to indicate bottom of stack. That's used when we stack labels in MPLS. In a layer 3 MPLS VPN as an example, we use two labels. One to indicate egress PE and another to indicate the customer network. So using the example where CE1 sends traffic to CE3, PE2 tells PE1 through BGP that the customer network has a label associated to it of let's say 100. But through OSPF, the loopback of PE2 is advertised through the core network to PE1. So PE1 knows that to get to CE3, it needs to use two labels. One label is used to get to PE2. That's called the next hop label and another label is used to indicate the customer network that PE2 should forward the traffic to. In other words, which VRF or virtual routing and forwarding instance does the traffic belong to? So PE1 is indicating with the outer label to P2 to forward traffic to PE2, and with the inner label, it's indicating to PE2 that the traffic belongs to the blue VRF or blue customer network. We can also stack additional labels. So this indicates that this is the last label in the stack. Time to live is used in a very similar way to time to live in IP version 4. It's used to stop loops in an MPLS network. You don't need to memorize or learn the MPLS configuration for the CCNA exam. I'm going to demonstrate how to configure MPLS in these videos, but don't try and memorize everything for the exam. In this topology again, I have two CE routers, CE1 and CE3, that are going to be part of the blue customer network, and CE2 and CE4, which are part of the green customer network. I also have multiple core routers in the MPLS network. We'll start off by configuring the core MPLS network, and then in subsequent videos, I'll show you how to configure layer 3 VPNs. 
at the moment I don't have MPLS enabled. So let's look at some of the problems before we implement MPLS. The first one is that customer routers can see the core network and can inject rogue routes into the core network. As an example, this is customer edge one, the router on the left in this topology, show IP route shows the full core OSPF network on the customer edge. So this customer edge router can ping the loopback of P1 as an example. It can ping or try and access any of the core routers. Now at the moment that telnet connection is refused on the core router, but that's simply because telnet hasn't been enabled on the core router. So if I enable telnet on the core router, the customer could potentially hack the core router. And notice here I've logged into the core router from the customer edge. So that's a problem. Customers could try and hack the core network. They could simply inject all kinds of rogue routes. So I'll inject a rogue route of 100, 100, 100, 100 into the core MPLS network. Before I press enter, notice on the core router P1, we don't have a network with 100. So again, show IP route shows us the full routing table. I'll search for 100, that doesn't appear in the routing table but the customer could now inject that route into the routing table, which can cause all kinds of problems. Notice the route has now appeared. If you simply trust the networks that customers advertise to you, they could break networking by injecting duplicate networks or incorrect networks into the core service provider network. That is a problem that takes place on the internet and therefore internet service providers block advertisements from customers. There's been a few cases as an example where an ISP in Pakistan injected a route into the BGP routing table that was more specific than the routes to YouTube. YouTube was thus not available to people around the world because the traffic was redirected to Pakistan. That happened because ISPs trust one another and need to for the internet to function. However, service providers don't want to trust customers. So we don't want to allow the customer to simply inject routes into the core OSPF network. Another problem as mentioned is overlapping networks. This is PE1, the router over here. At the moment, I've configured gigabit01 with this IP address, but I can't simply go on to gigabit02 and configure the same IP address. I'm told that the address overlaps with gigabit 01. I'm restricted to using a single global IP routing table when I'm not using MPLS. But when I do use MPLS layer three VPNs, I can create a virtual routing and forwarding instances and configure the same IP addresses on multiple interfaces to customers, but have them appear in separate routing tables. So overlapping addresses are supported, but they physically segmented and separated from the core routing table. That provides better security and also provides better functionality because the service provider doesn't have to dictate to the customer which IP addresses are used on specific links. At the moment, the CE1 router, as an example, can trace to the core routers. I'll disable IP domain lookup to speed things up. But as an example, it's able to trace to the core P1 router. So it sends traffic to PE1, P2, and then P3. And by the same token, if I trace to CE3, so I'll trace to 172.16.2.2, that traffic goes through the core MPLS network and I'm able to see every router along the path. Service providers may want to hide their core routers. 
So when we trace, we don't want the customer to see these core routers. So the show IP route command once again shows us the main routing table or RIP or routing information base on a router. Show IP Ceph shows us the Ceph forwarding table or FIB or forwarding information base. At the moment, we are not running MPLS layer 3 VPNs. So we have a main routing table and a main forwarding information base on this router. On PE1, we could ping the loopback of PE2 using the loopback as the source. So I've pinged from the loopback of PE1 to the loopback of PE2. We could also do a trace from PE1 to PE2 using the loopback as the source. So I'm tracing via P2, then P1, then P3, and lastly PE2. MPLS is once again not enabled here. So show IP Ceph 5555 shows us those details, show IP route, and our five network shows this information. You'll notice there are no labels in the output of these commands. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I wish you all the very best.